Hello and welcome back to the Space News by SpaceIndustryNews.com. My name is Will, and today we'll be speaking about NASA's Dawn mission, which is the asteroid mission, and also exoplanets, large, enormous, gigantic, big, 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 Earth-like worlds with giant swaths of water. Giant oceans. Water worlds, if you will. Also, we'll be speaking about some SpaceX uh, helipad-equipped boats that will be really instrumental in bringing astronauts home safely from space. So, sit down, relax, enjoy some space news. Let's go. Now, let's talk about some NASA Dawn spacecrafts. Unfortunately, it's gone, my friends. It's gone silent. This asteroid hunter, well, they lost signal. The Dawn space mission, uh, it missed a scheduled communication session with NASA's Deep Space Network on Wednesday, October 31st and Thursday, November 1st. And after the team eliminated other possible causes for the miscommunications, Mission managers concluded that the spacecraft finally ran out of hydrazine, the fuel that enables the spacecraft to control its pointing. So that means that Dawn can no longer keep its antenna uh, trained on Earth to communicate with mission control to turn its solar panels to the sun to recharge. Effectively, that means that the Dawn mission is uh, it's over. It's done. So, unfortunately, it's over, but they did some great science. Uh, it launched 11 years ago to visit two largest, or two of the largest objects in the main asteroid belt. Um, currently, right now, it's in orbit around the dwarf planet series, uh, which it will remain in for decades to come. And um, a NASA spokesperson said, Today, we celebrate the end of our Dawn mission its incredible technical achievements, the vital science it gave us, and the entire team who enabled the spacecraft to make these discoveries. Um, the astounding images and data that Dawn collected from Vesta and Ceres are critical to understanding the history and evolution of our solar system. So this thing, this thing that we launched out into space, out into the asteroid belt, Hundreds of people worked on things, you know, from software to hardware to the people after it, like the launch. So many people worked on this thing. And for some reason, you know, it, it finally ran out of fuel. It can't point towards us. And the mission is over. But it launched in 2007. And um, they put about 4.3 billion miles <laughs> This four point three billion miles. My car right now has two hundred and thirty thousand miles on it. Two hundred thirty thousand miles. Now, that's pretty good for a car, but four point three billion miles. It was propelled by ion engines, um, and it achieved many firsts along the way. In 2011, when Dawn arrived at Vesta, second largest world in the main asteroid belt, the spacecraft became the first to orbit a body in the region between Mars and Jupiter. And in 2015, when Dawn went into orbit around Ceres, a uh, dwarf planet that is almost the largest world in the asteroid belt, the mission became the first to visit a dwarf planet and go into orbit around two destinations beyond Earth. NASA spokesperson said, um, or Mark Raymond, I'm sorry, the chief engineer and the mission director said, the fact that my car's license plate frame proclaims my other vehicles in the main out <laughs> asteroid belt shows how much pride I take in Dawn. Um, the demands we put on Dawn were tremendous, but it met the challenge every time. It's hard to say goodbye to this amazing spaceship, but it's time. And the data that Dawn beamed back to Earth from its four science experiments enabled scientists to compare two planet-like worlds that evolved very differently. Among its accomplishments, Dawn showed how important 
location was to the way objects in our early solar system formed and evolved. Uh, Don also reinforced the idea that dwarf planets could have hosted oceans over a significant part of their history and potentially still do. So there's possible that we got some water out there in the dwarf planets. I mean, it, later on, we're going to talk about some exoplanets that are made of basically 50% water. So why wouldn't these little guys, these dwarf planets, have water on them of some sort? So, you know, there's a possibility out there. Um, so Carol Raymond at JPL said, in many ways, Don's legacy is just beginning. Don's data sets will be deeply mined by scientists working on how planets grow and differentiate and when and where life could have formed in our solar system. Ceres and Vesta are important to the study in distant planetary systems too, as they provide a glimpse of the conditions that may exist around young stars. So this is a history lesson. This spacecraft went out to the asteroid belt. It's beamed back tons and tons of data. They're going to be mining it for a while. And, you know, we're going to learn about things that we never even knew existed. You know, we're going to learn about things. So many new discoveries from this thing. So unfortunately, the spacecraft has ended. Um, but its legacy lives on through all the data that scientists and data miners are going to dig through for I don't even know how many tens of years, maybe a hundred years. I don't know. That's probably a lot of data. I mean, it was what, 4.3 billion miles away. So there's probably data there somewhere for the next hundred years, I'm assuming. Well, hopefully uh, they get at it soon and we get some more information. And when we do, we'll let you know. But now uh, let's go to some exoplanet news and how Exoplanets that are just a few times larger than Earth show that they have vast liquid water oceans. Much, much bigger. Way bigger oceans than Earth has. So what is the thing that everything needs to be alive that we know of? It's water. Everything needs water to live that we know of on our planet. Whenever we look someplace else, when we're looking at Mars... To find new life, we're looking for water first, because that's what we know. As humans, that's what we know creates life. So uh, this new study shows that, uh, our research shows that um, we might find it. We might find life all over our galaxy. A scientist looked at the mass of super-Earths. Um, it's a common planet. And But it's not present in our own solar system. They're large, much larger Earths, Earth-sized rocky or Earth-type planets. They're rocky planets, rocky worlds, and they're several times larger than Earth. And the team's analysis of, well, or of known super-Earths reveals something astounding and crazy. Many of them may be literal water worlds. So these worlds may be half water okay, these super earths might be half water liquid water uh it was a team from harvard and they determined that these planets with 1.5 times earth's radius or below would be terrestrial or rocky and super earths above 2.5 earth radius might be more like tiny versions of neptune or uranus and the two water-dominated planets in our solar system are far from life-friendly. Um, so sup these super-Earths, they have gigantic, gigantic oceans. Water worlds. So where there's water, usually there's life, right? Um, so it shows that they might not be life-friendly, though. They might be enshrouded by a mostly water vapor atmosphere which means that further below there might be oceans at extreme pressures and temperatures between 390 and 930 degrees Fahrenheit. 
It's 200 to 500 degrees Celsius. Um, so uh, Li Zhang of Harvard said, life could develop in certain near surface layers of these water worlds when the pressure, temperature, and chemical conditions are appropriate. He's the uh, study's lead, and Zhang also believes that the planets may form more like a gas giant with a core deep underneath a dense atmosphere. So the atmosphere might be full of water, and then there might be a layer underneath that's water as well, and there might be certain conditions in this water that could harbor some life. So Zhang said, uh, one has to realize that although water appears to be precious and rare on Earth and other inner solar system terrestrial plants, planets, it is in fact one of the most abundant substances in the universe, since oxygen is the third most abundant element after hydrogen and helium. There's a lot of water out there. And this just proves that there are water planets out there. We're looking up at the stars and, you know, way, way, way far away. Uh, there's planets out there with water in them. And it's possible that there's life on those planets. Water life. So what could this life look like? What could it do? You know, how? there's so many questions you can ask. But now that we have proof and based on the team's modeling up to 35 percent of known planets might be water water worlds so that's over a third of all planets that we know of could be water worlds wow so there might so there's exo oceans not just exoplanets there's exo oceans on these exoplanets and that's really intriguing so in the next couple couple of years 10 15 years we're going to start searching for more of these water worlds um, and I'm sure we're going to find a lot more because if there's 35% known planets might be water worlds, um, they're going to do some more research to figure out exactly what that data, uh, how that data crosses, um, other solar systems and other galaxies. So, I mean, exoplanets, I mean, there's going to be crazy science happening in the next 10 years, more water worlds will be found. I'm sure. And we will hopefully find out that we're not alone. Finally, it's been a long time. Actually, it hasn't been that long. I mean, we haven't been doing this kind of science for that long in comparison to the history of the universe and the history of the earth. So hopefully we get to it in, you know, in the next 50 years, I think that would be really cool. And I'll hopefully still be around by then. That would, be, that would be even better. So uh, so there you have it. We have 35% of known planets as, uh, as water worlds out there. It's a Harvard study, Harvard University study. And, uh, you know, SpaceX, they're launching things into space. But they also have things down here on Earth that help bring astronauts home safely. And they've upgraded their SpaceX ship and its crew just went through dramatic dress rehearsals running through how they'd rescue injured astronauts after they return to Earth. And when SpaceX starts ferrying astronauts to and from the ISS, International Space Station, Space Station next year, the company's ocean vessel, Go Searcher, will be tasked with recovering SpaceX's crew, crewed Dragon capsules. Keep stumbling over my words, man. What's wrong with me today? Uh, the splashed out in the Atlantic Ocean. Ship is now equipped for a worst case scenario scenario with medical treatment facilities and a helipad in case returning astronauts need to be evacuated quickly uh, to a hospital. So they're making all these changes for the safety of uh, of our astronauts. That's really cool, and it's uh, it's part of a fleet of ocean vessels that SpaceX has acquired over the years to aid in its spaceflight efforts. And uh, the most famous of those are SpaceX's autonomous drone ships, which are used as landing pads when the company's Falcon 9 rockets are recovered in the ocean after launches. So when you see those rockets come down on the, on the ocean, uh, it's one of these kind of ships. Um, now the Ghost Searcher, uh, used to accompany these drone ships when they were tugged back to shore as a uh, support vessel. But at the end of summer, 
SpaceX gave GoSearcher a suite of upgrades, including